Saludos a todos. What it is, this is your brother David Rodriguez with another episode of Hispaniola History Channel. And this is the series Poltiguesa, the Portuguese of Hispaniola. And this part is called Knights of Santiago. Who were the Knights of Santiago? What were some of their signs, shields, and symbols? Some of the things that we could look at to better understand who these people were. And the Black Knight of Santiago. We're gonna get into this historical painting, the Knight's early presence in Hispaniola, and how this created a situation of wealth, power, and independence on the North Coast for those residents. And then we also gonna get into the Santiago in the Americas and this El Camino. So let's get into this, let's go. This is the Hispaniola History Channel. La Historia de Hispaniola, presented by David Rodriguez. The Portuguese coat of arms displays the Fort Castle, which they have built around the world. Here you have the depiction of one of the earliest, earliest illustrations of the coat of arms for Portugal. Uh, dated 1509, it probably displays the Fort Castle, which was a symbol of wealth and power displayed throughout the world. So these forts had a specific uh, purpose to defend the ports and the land in which the Portuguese occupied. Um, so who would protect and manage all these uh, forts and ports built by the Portuguese around the world? Enter the Knights of Santiago. I have a source here provided by the Atlas Historico del Portugal, says the Order of Santiago possessed many domains granted by the Portuguese crown. So the Order of Santiago were a Portuguese entity. It says Portuguese military orders, the Santiago Knights, were the first front line against the incursion from the Moors Algarve in the 13th century. As these domains were partitioned into comiendas, we heard that word before uh, tied to the Spanish in these colonies in the Caribbean in which they offer some ecomiendas uh, to other Spanish nobles and to some uh, Native Americans who later on become caciques. So the Portuguese look like they started this first. It says this, these domains were partitioned into comiendas and granted by the order in encomiendum to a Santiago knight, comendandol which probably where we get the word commander from, uh, entrusted with the obligation on defending them. So the Portuguese would give these knights these grants, uh, which gives them the right to protect and defend the land. Granted to distinguish individual knights of the order, still contingent on military service. So you have to be involved in military service to be part of the knights. Grand masters of the order were among the most powerful men in Portugal. The Comendados stood at the peak of the rural society in their districts. So each one of these early colonies that we hear about in the Caribbean, in Mexico, South America, as we could remember in part one, and where we learn who were the most powerful men in Portugal, it leads us back to the Sephardic Jews of Portugal who ran the ports and the trades throughout the world. So understand there's a connection here between the Santiago Knights and the Sephardic Jews of Portugal, both having the same origins. Let's get into the shield or the coat of arms for the surname Santiago. It was a habitation name from any of the numerous places so-called from the dedication of their church to St. James. The Apostle St. James the Greater is the patric saint of Spain. Following the 9th century legend, that he visited and evangelized the country after the death of Christ. Is there any reference to this in the Bible? Hmm, it looks like there is. The book of Romans 15 verses 24 through 28 says, Whomever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust you in my journey. Whosoever I take my journey into Spain. So here you have a biblical character from the Bible talking about they're going to Spain. So not only is Spain mentioned in the Bible, characters of the Bible had intentions on reaching Spain. So that's very important. If you have some kind of Spanish ancestry, a Spanish surname, this should be something that you look at with some kind of pride. Let me 
uh, go down to verse 28. It says, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So there's an intention there for a saint to reach Spain and spread the word of God. So now let's discuss the sword, the sword of Santiago. Um, here's some information here provided by a source called Spain, a portable inheritance from 1157 to 1300 from Blackwell Publishing Limited, uh, written by Peter Linhan. As the sword represents the chivalrous character of the Apostle St. James, who's really Santiago, and his martyr ways, since he was decapitated with a sword. It can also symbolize taking the sword in the name of Christ. Uh, some of the coat of arms, where you're dealing with the surname or the um, anything attached to Portugal or the name Santiago, um, you're going to see some seashells and some of the coat of arms of Santiago. Uh, some of these seashells have a symbolic meaning to them. El Camino seashells. It says here, the scallop shell is used as a symbol of direction along the Camino, pointing pilgrims towards Santiago. Pilgrims also wear this symbol themselves, which further enhances the camaraderie along the great walking trail. So it's some kind of brotherhood involved here with these seashells. It's also quite useful to assure yourself that you are on the right track. You're walking along the right track to the Camino, El Camino, to this historic place where Santiago, St. James, once stood. Now let's get into the concept of the Dark Knights, the Dark Knights of Santiago. So first of all, is this image real uh, of this royal Dark Knight? And some contemporary scholars um, who are coming after the fact want to identify that this person is Jao de Sabanasco, who was a court jester or clown for the king of Portugal. And somehow he was a former slave and somehow rose through the ranks as a court jester. And the king of Spain somehow found favor in him and gave him some position as a knight. Some of the sources are not really super reliable because they kind of come after the fact of the painting. We know the painting is a historical painting. Uh, it's called the King's Fountain, uh, a painting that could be found in Lisbon, Portugal, dating back to 1570. Uh, and one of the sources, uh, the African Europe, written by Stephen Goodwin, Giles' name is written as ST, not SA. ST uh, denotes the word saint as an abbreviation for the word saint. Also, he's described as a black in the original records the word african is added later by the authors but like i said earlier this book is not referencing the actual historical painting that came years 100 years before the book another book uh racisms from the crusade to the 20th century is making some ukraine saying that this character jao de Panasco or jao de saint saint Panasco, depending on which sources you're going with Panasco received racist abuse from his skin color, smelled bad. There's no way that this person who's uh, sitting in this scene here dressed more royal and more extravagant than anyone else in the painting was some sort of court gesture of clown for the king. Um, that he couldn't keep his white Morisca wife. That's according to this source. But again, the source does not reference the painting. Uh, this came way after in which they're trying to create this narrative for this historical figure on this painting. But the sources are not referencing the painting. So when looking at the full canvas of the Chafariz de El Rey, the king's fountain, a Renaissance painting by an unknown artist depicting Moorish Portugal sometime around 1570 and 1580. And we know what was going on around that time. So the original painting does not mention Jao de Sapanasco. Uh, first of all, the reason we are aware of this painting is because of this brother right here uh, was doing research on his family history. And his research took him all the way to Portugal 
and he found out about this painting that was housed in a mansion in Lisbon. So he got first-hand account on the painting, and it was his drive uh, to research his own family history because his surname is Santiago that led him to the truth about this black knight. And as I said, nowhere in the documentary, nowhere in this article, nowhere in here is mentioned about this so-called Jao de Sapanasco. So with the name King's Founding, who else is in this painting would fit the description of the King of Portugal? So-called black man looking very royal on a horse and quite possibly might have been the King of Portugal as the painting is titled The King's Founding. Who else would have been the King in Portugal at that time. How does this relate to the history of the Americas and specifically the history of Hispaniola? So Santiago of Hispaniola was founded early by the Portuguese Knights of Santiago. Um, as you can see here, here is the symbol of the city of Santiago. That's the royal seal. Again, depicting those seashells. Reading from a source here, which was originally written in Spanish, but translated into English, Santiago de los Caballeros, in English means St. James of the Knights, commonly known as Santiago, is the second largest city in the Dominican Republic, but the fourth largest city in the Caribbean by population. It was founded in 1495 during the first wave of European settlement in the New World. The, the city is the first Santiago of the Americas. Let me read that again. This city is the first Santiago of the Americas. The name of the city, St. James of the Knights, refers to the Hildagos de la Isabella, a group of knights who had come from La Isabella City to stay in Santiago. Sometimes the city is called Santiago de los Caballores, Los Trentas Caballores. Uh, translated into English, St. James of the 30 Knights, 30 Knights who first settled here in 1495, coming from La Isabella City. Now, the, like I said, depending on what source you, you go with, because this happened very early in American history, there are conflicting sources. There's some sources that said that they came with someone named Isabella and that these knights were protecting this person named Isabella. We'll get into that a little bit in future episodes, but know for surety that the Knights of Santiago settled on the north coast of Hispaniola very early in American history. And if you've gone to my previous videos, I've covered a little bit about the history of the north coast. Let's continue. We know throughout Hispaniola, there are these old forts, these castle fort style structures that's very similar and signature to the Portuguese and how they were building forts throughout the world. So these Portuguese style forts found globally are found in Hispaniola. We know there's one on the south coast and there's similar structures on the north coast. Here's one here, the fortress on the north coast, La Vega, ruins of La Concepcion fortress in Pueblo Viejo National Park. Pueblo Viejo means old park. You know they brought specific uh, skills and trades and products uh, went hand in hand with their worldly travels. They had spices from all parts of the world, uh, products from all parts of the world. So this gave them a specific advantage uh, due to the fact that they were traveling the world before the Spanish and sold by the Portuguese merchants on the north coast included uh, sugar, tobacco, rum, uh, they did cattle ranching, farming, fishing, pearls. I mean with the pearl diving that was of course the Native Americans who uh, handled that segment. They handled a lot of these segments of the fishing, the, the tobacco. Uh, some of these things were dealt through partnerships uh, with the Portuguese and some of the native inhabitants, the aboriginals on the north coast. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the overall vibe with the Spanish Empire was to kind of go into other territories. So Spanish ships slowly started arriving, little by little, by 1600s. So the only thing left was the products brought in by the Portuguese. Let's read here from the Dominican Republic, A Natural History, Frank Moya Pons, pages 42 to 44, that even the 
quote unquote fugitive slaves aided the Portuguese in Santo Domingo. So uh, starting from 1541, the uh, Spanish crown started increasing their taxes um, on certain Spanish goods. So things were expensive on the Spanish side in terms of Santo Domingo. So this uh, led some of the um, residents to find other ways and other means to get their goods. It says in the early years, the residents of these areas sold their hides uh, and other products to Spanish ships. But as the arrival of ships became less frequent, colonists gradually turned to French, English, and Portuguese smugglers. That even the fugitive slaves aided the development of contraband since the lack of safe travel was impeded colonial authorities from effectively controlling all the regions of the island. So there was a lot of regions in the island where the authorities of Santo Domingo just could not control, manage, or even deal with. So this is what gave rise to a lot of that independence on the North Coast. Uh, let me read on, on the top of page 44. It says, the Cimarrones, a.k.a. the Maroons, the Cimarrones learned that they too could trade products stolen from the Spaniards in exchange for imported goods. So now the Maroons are getting into the mix, stealing products from the Spaniards and trading them with the Portuguese on the North Coast. So this is creating a whole industry here on the North Coast during the 1600s. It says here, at first the colonists preferred trading with the Portuguese since they spoke a similar language. So the colonists in Hispaniola, the Spanish colonists from Santo Domingo, said they preferred dealing with the Portuguese because their languages were similar. So same way how the French and the English tried to come and sell their products, the Spaniards like, nah, you know, we good. We'd rather deal with the Portuguese. Our language and our culture is a little bit more similar. Another scholar of Dominican history, Juan Bosch, in the social composition of the Dominican Republic, he claims that the Portuguese were wealthier than the Spaniards of Hispaniola. They said the Portuguesa is a beautiful gold piece from the Portuguese with the die stamp of that nation, whose weight and intrinsic value exceed one of eight duros. How did the Portuguese coin come to be the most common in Santo Domingo? And so the author is asking, how is it that the Portuguese currency is worth more than the Spanish currency in Santo Domingo? That's a good question. It says at the beginning of the 19th century, now we're going into the 19th century, the Portuguesa continued to circulate in the Sabao. So now we're in the 18, 1900s that the Portuguese Portuguesa coin is circulating in the Sabao uh, worth more than the Spanish dollar in Santo Domingo. So this is giving an indication in terms of the wealth that developed over hundreds of years in that North Coast controlled by the Portuguese trade and the Portuguese people. So although the first Santiago in the Americas was in Hispaniola, the Santiago Knights also set up seven major port cities throughout the Americas. The Santiago Knights also settled in Jamaica, what we know now as Jamaica. It was first known as the Colony of Santiago back in 1509. They had an early uh, camaraderie or partnership with the Maroons and Hispaniola. So this may create a clear perspective on terms of who those early Maroons in Jamaica were when the British arrived in 1655. Let's continue. Santiago throughout the Americas. There's one in Puerto Rico, Punta Santiago of Humacao in Puerto Rico, a port city in Puerto Rico bearing the name Santiago. Let's continue. There's a Santiago de Cuba. And in Chile, there's a Santiago, city of Santiago. In Mexico, there's a Santiago, founded very early, 1648, by a Diego Rodriguez. And then finally, there's a Santiago in North America, except we call it San Diego. So the Santiago in North America is San Diego, which is really Santiago. San Diego means St. Jacob or San Jacob, which later becomes San Diego or Santiago and San Diego. So this is all established by the same people, the Santiago Knights. They were in San Diego. They created this 
Camino Path, establishing a whole bunch of churches along that coast in California. This brings us back to that shells of Santiago, those Santiago shells bearing the symbol of Santiago. This reminds us of the Camino de Santiago in what we call Spain over in Europe, which is an interesting comparison. And both San Diego and Spain in Europe share a similarity on how these churches were constructed in a similar path, El Camino. San Diego's Camino versus Spain of Europe's Camino. Camino in Spain in Europe only has eight churches. The Camino in California has 21 churches. It looks like the churches in San Diego, California region in North America is following that story of Santiago to the T. More on that in future videos. But this shows the influence on the Knights of Santiago. But for now, thanks for your time, folks. Uh, what you watched was the Knights of Santiago, part of the Boitiguesa series. This is Knights of Santiago. Stay tuned for part three, titled The Brotherhood. Boitiguesa, The Brotherhood. We're gonna get into why uh, the Portuguese had this advantage in the Americas and throughout the world and how this might have been due to some kind of alliance with certain populations uh, throughout the world and in the Americas. Uh, so part three titled The Brotherhood. Hope you stay tuned for that. Until then, this is your brother David Rodriguez. Peace. Signing out. This is the Hispaniola History Channel. La Historia de Hispaniola presented by David Rodriguez. visit afroindios.com.